The quarantine um, fiasco, which I think stands alongside the testing fiasco, to me feels like a point that's worthy of focus because it seems more fixable. The testing thing, we obviously screwed that up royally as a country. They are trying to scale it up. A lot of effort is going into that. It's still going to take a long time and it will hamper our efforts until we've got it in place. Meanwhile, without testing, all we can do is large-scale mitigation efforts, like getting rid of crowds, telling people not to fly, other things like that. But also people who believe they've been exposed should quarantine. Would fed clear federal standards on how to quarantine and under what circumstances help? That's not the right approach anyway. Okay. You don't want infected people or suspected infected people in there with their families. They'll okay. just pass it on to them. China has had enormous success in beating down its epidemic. We don't know what's going to happen when China tries to reopen its economy and let people go back to the factories and back to the uh, subways and back to offices and restaurants and everything else. We don't know what's going to happen, and they're going to do it in a very slow, graduated way, but they have been in lockdown all this time. But we see the drone shots from these cities and we think, ooh, lockdown, it looks terrible, there's no, no traffic on the street. That's not the point of what they did. They had to do that in order to introduce the measures they were going to take, they were actually going to fight the epidemic. And that is testing, 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 find the virus. So one thing is, no matter where you go, if you are able to get out of the house in there, you know, if, if you go into any building, your temperature is taken. I came into this building, nobody took my temperature. They asked me some silly questions I could have lied about. But, um, you know, they, you, you get your, your fever taken. You get into a bus, your temperature is taken. You walk into the train station, your temperature is taken. You walk into the building, you walk back to your apartment building, your temperature is taken. And what happens if, you're t if you show a fever? Then you're sent to a fever clinic. People are not sent to their own doctor's offices. Your doctor's office is dangerous. One of those tests will make you cough, uh, usually cough or gag, and then you've infected the doctor. And then the doctor's office is out, and you've possibly infected everybody else in the waiting room. So they are sent to specific fever clinics which the Chinese have had since they battled SARS back in 2002. They designed these and basically mothballed them. It's, a, it's a, usually an entrance to a hospital. It's separate from the main entrance. They're, they're met by people in complete protective gear. The temperature is taken. They're asked quickly what their symptoms are, whether they've been exposed, how they've been exposed. They get a quick white blood cell count, which takes about half an hour to see whether or not they have bacterial pneumonia. It doesn't tell you what the bacteria is, but it tells you whether or not you've likely got, it, got that. They get a quick flu test to see if they have flu. If you've got one of those, maybe you can be excluded and go home. You're simply something else. But if you uh, don't have either one of those, then you're given a CT scan. CT scans in this country take half an hour to an hour, and they're you know, extremely expensive things. There they have portable CT scanners. They have pushed people through those things at the rate of 200 a day. A couple of slices of the lungs, and that's all, to see whether or not there are these ground glass opacities in both lungs that are a pretty good indication of this. All right, if you come up positive for that, then you are going to uh, get a PCR test, which is the test we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's basically a nasal swab is the usual way to do it, which is push a Q-tip up your nose so far it feels like it's going into your brain. It's not very pleasant, but then they do that on site. They've gotten it down to four hours. There's no sending it off to the state health department. So you no. sit and wait for it to come back. And you sit and wait. You are told, sit you know, a couple of yards apart from everybody else. People are sitting there, I was, it was described to me, they're sitting there with their pink envelopes with their CT scans inside them, and they're afraid of each other because they all know that they might be, you know, mm -hmm. they might be sitting next to somebody who's, uh, who's got the virus. And uh, once the scan results come back, and if they, if they can't get the scan results back that day, they have to go to a hotel, a quarantine hotel, and wait until the results come apart back. Apart from their family. Apart from their family, and that is the key element. There is no home isolation. There is no home quarantine. 75 to 80 percent of the transmission in China was in family clusters. What would make the news was things like, oh, my God, it's in the prisons. Oh, my God, it's in Parliament or whatever. It wasn't in Parliament there, but you, you'd hear these kind of, oh, my. but 75 to 80 percent of it was inside the family. And they knew they had to stop that if they were going to stop the disease. So people were literally quickly taken away from their families to these giant gymnasiums or stadiums where there were, they were not concentration camps. They were beds you know, there, and there were nurses in protective gear to watch out for people. They even had dance classes in these things. Because when you have lots of little old ladies sort of sitting there together waiting to see if they're okay, if you get them all up dancing, one, it helps clear their lungs if they have pneumonia, and the people who can't get up may be the ones who are crashing. It's not a bad policy. We, we laugh at the pictures when you see people dancing in what look like moon suits, but in fact, that was something medically smart that was going on. If people actually need to be hospitalized, you know, the, the, the people who don't need to be hospitalized who are ones in the so-called 80% of mild cases. I'm sorry I ever used that expression when I wrote that first article because mild, when you look carefully at the study, is everything from 
almost no symptoms to pneumonia, but doesn't need oxygen, doesn't need hospitalization. Wow. Now, I've had pneumonia. I've had walking pneumonia. That was not like having a mild cold. That was serious. I had it about two weeks different from when Hillary Clinton got it. You saw her collapse on the street. Mm. She had to be carried into her van when she collapsed. I was standing on third place playing softball with some friends and thought, I'm going to collapse here. Um, and, you know, went to the doctor the next day. So those are the cases. They're isolated away. Well, they're hospital. And people actually sort of move through the system. Suspect cases, uh, mild to moderate cases, and hospitalized severe and critical cases who are actually in hospitals. And the crucial thing about that system is break the chains of transmission and also do what you can to keep the hospitals from getting overwhelmed. Because when the hospitals get overwhelmed, you have to say, okay, she lives, she lives, but he dies and he dies or whatever. You know, she's young and has kids. We'll save her. Grandmother, goodbye. Those are the choices they are making in northern Italy right now. And they're going to be making them all over Italy pretty soon. And we will too. Donald McNeil, science and health reporter for the New York Times. People, um, are going to clip this and send it to their local health department for having you describe this because of the distance between what you're describing and what we're doing and what we're preparing for. Uh, but thank you, Donald McNeil, uh, reporter for The New York Times. Thank you for being here.